Hey, what's going on, No Nation? It's CJ Wilson here with another episode of Dope Talk. We've got a special one here as the excuse me, as the Florida State Seminoles kick off the ACC play of the uh, football season. Here we have AJ Black with us, um, publisher for BC Eagles Insider, um, 247 contributor. AJ, how's it going? Hey, thank you for having me on, CJ. It's good to talk to you. Oh, no, most definitely. Um, Once I was doing my little research in regards to uh, Boston College and, and your name popped up a lot, so it was a no-brainer to you know, reach out to you uh, to try to get you mm -hmm. on. I try to get you know the best reporters from each beat in regards to the opponent, uh, opponent for the upcoming week, and it was uh, definitely a no-brainer to try to have you on to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, have a, I have a lot to talk about for this one, so ask away. <laughs> Uh, most definitely. All right. This segment of the show is be called uh, it's called Behind Enemy Lines. Uh, AJ, we'll go ahead and get started. This is the question that everyone wants to hear in regards to this game so far. Um, what are you hearing in regards to the uh, prognosis of the uh, game being played, uh, whether it could be pushed back to a different time or anything like that with the hurricane brewing in the, um, in the Atlantic? Yeah, I think it's a big question a lot of people are asking, right? Like, is this game going to happen on time? What's going to happen with... Um you know, the weather. So what I've seen is two things. So obviously this, I don't think this game will be played on Friday. I think it's, that's too big of an ask with, you know, 24 hours for Florida state to be asked to travel up and do all that. I don't think that'll happen. But the other piece, I think looking at the, um, the weather in the hurricane forecast, it, it looks like it's only going to clip Massachusetts. Like it's going to, like, I think folks have seen that like, um, Maine and URI, their game got pushed, um, to another day but it's aiming at maine so it's not going to hit massachusetts um things could obviously change but it looks like that'll be okay i mean the only thought that i could think of is that the, the potentially that they move the game to later in the afternoon or in the evening because it looks like it's going to pass through massachusetts earlier in the day maybe they push it towards you know a four or eight o'clock start and do a night game um that's a possibility i haven't heard anything new on that though um but it would make sense that way fans can safely get to the game and not have to worry about it yeah, I agree. Um, that, that does make sense to kind of push it back because just looking at the projections, it should be uh, well gone by that time in the day. So mm -hmm. it would make sense to kind of push it back. And it was kind of weird, too, because I guess, you know, I was kind of expecting there some type of formal announcement on Wednesday. But hearing what you're saying, it kind of makes sense, you know, in regards right. to possibly no announcement to this point in time. Right, right. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they had anything to announce. So we'll have to we'll have to wait and see and, you know, maybe we'll find out in the next 24 hours. OK, so. This is the story red bandana game. First of all, let's talk about the red bandana and exactly what it means for us to come to sell. Um, I know it's, it's I got another question after you give you give your explanation because um it seems like FSU is every time we were on the schedule for a you know a road game to BC, we're we're designated um tag tag for that uh, for the opponent for the red bandana game. Yeah, so if for folks that don't know about the red bandana, you'll see the uniforms um, and hopefully you hear the story because it's a really important story to hear about. Wells Crowther um, is known as the med the man in the red bandana. He uh, was a Boston College graduate, played lacrosse at BC, uh, and then went to work at the World Trade Center uh, in 2001. When the planes hit, um, this there were stories after everything had happened about a guy in a red bandana that saved i think it was 13 people's lives and going in and out in and out um and they realized that it was wells that was doing this wells's mom knew him as a guy that always had a red bandana with him and he, he was wearing it to protect his face from the the smoke and stuff but he saved 13 people and he ended up past he ended up of dying in the towers the towers collapsed when he went it back in to save somebody else so to memorialize him boston college since 2000 i think 14 has been doing a red bandana game where they wear these special uniforms you know you'll see the the, the patterns and it's on their arms and it's on there you know they'll have like the armbands and the, the gloves and stuff like that they'll do special pro um they'll do um you know presentations to different like um, military groups or, or fire and police departments. And they usually have, uh, well, it was Wells' parents. His dad passed away about three or four years ago, but his mom will be there. He, she almost is always there. And they do a special presentation for her uh, there as well. And they'll, they'll tell the story. I mean, if you haven't, I'm only doing a brief recreation of it. If you haven't watched it, look for on YouTube, the man in the red bandana, find the ESPN video that they produced about 10 years ago. It's so well done. It tells a story. It 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 
it hits hard watching it because it's you have the survivors in there you hear what they have to say so it for for a school like boston college it doesn't have a lot of like big traditions that you guys know like planting the spear things like that this is bc's big thing and it's mm-hmm. it's a special moment from college football so um yeah i, I know florida state gets it a lot but um it's it's a it's a big moment for for bc yeah and i hate it because um you know, the players are riled, riled up the, the fans come out of support uh, like yep. I said, it's an emotional game, and usually BC comes out plays pretty well, and we've been on the losing stick of a lot of these games, which has been fun for FSU fans. But um, just to you, like I say, thirteen lives, and to kind of commemorate his life in, in that in that fashion is is very cool. So I expect a, a pretty you know ruckus and live crowd yep. chest on the hill for the game, depending on the weather. You know, if yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of as well too. If yeah. it's a, if it's a, if they're playing noon start and it's disgusting out there, I, I hope I hope that if it is that way that they do move the game so that this can have its space and they can be on ABC and tell the story because it's it's good for everyone to know about it. But um, and and the fans would show up, but if it's disgusting, you know, right, right, fingers right. crossed on that. Yeah, exactly. Right, let's get to Boston College a little bit. Let's talk about the quarterback, um, Thomas Castellanos. Uh, yep. A lot of people don't really well, didn't know at FSU recruited him pretty heavily out of high school uh, for mm-hmm. another position aside from quarterback, but he was pretty close to uh, to um, committed to FSU and in, 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 in being a part of those. Yeah, so he was recruited. I saw two four seven's Florida State site uh, went to that press conference and was saying that he was recruited as a running back, as an athlete. He ended up at UCF. Uh, he was recruited by Daryl Wyatt, who is BC's wide receiver coach. Um, and so he ended up transferring over BC after the last couple of years, definitely needed more quarterback depth and um, getting a guy like Castellanos was kind of seemed like a no brainer a guy that, you know, was pretty well recruited and had a good pedigree to him and, you know, felt like a guy that fit their system. Um, I, I have to say I was shocked that they threw him in as soon as they did. Uh, because as you see pictures up on the on the screen there, Emmett Moorhead was everywhere. Um, you know, ACC Media Days. Uh, you know, Jeff Halfley named him the starter the week before NIU, the first game of the mm-hmm. season. Um, and that they pulled him after two two series, and mm-hmm. he hasn't been back. Uh, for a guy that you told, like Jeff Halfley said, like you know, Phil Dracovic, who's now at Pitt, they let, they basically just said, see you later. Good luck, you know, with your future. We have Emmett Moorhead for them to just pull it on him in like two game, two weeks, not even two weeks, sorry. Two series was weird. Now that being said, I can see why with Castellanos. Castellanos um, is dynamic. Like he can, he can run. He can, his arm was more impressive than I, I thought. He's a small guy. He's like 5'10". Um, and he, he's got swagger to him. Like he has a lot of um, confidence in himself. <laughs> uh, it bit themselves a bit last week against Holy Cross. We got nailed with a couple personal fouls for taunting, um, which he which halfway said he's going to bench him if he keeps doing it. Uh, but he, he can throw the ball. He can run the ball. And he seems like he's getting better and better as they go along, uh, which is good because, you know, he's a first year quarterback for BC and they're, they're asking him to do quite a bit. What's your, I guess in, in the preseason, what, was there any buzz about him in camp or things like that? For Like you said, for him to pull that plug within two quarters, you know, they had to have had that thought yeah. prior, you know, in regards to playing Thomas. So that's pretty interesting. Was there a lot of preseason buzz with him making plays? Was he splitting reps with the first team? There was buzz. Unfortunately, as someone who covers the team, their practices are almost completely closed. And the stuff that you can see is like, you know, hitting the sleds and stuff like that. I don't get anything out of that. Uh, so it's hard to say you get, you get the press releases and you hear about it from the staff. Right. So he, he came up a lot and his name was popping quite a bit. Um, I, my gut going into this year was that he was going to be like, you know, they use him for change of pace. Like, you know, if their offense has been stalling out, put him in, see if you can get some lightning going. I did not expect him to go in and immediately take the starter job. Um, but you know, it, it does kind of add up based off of what you heard and you know, what Halfley's trying to do out there, which is to run a balanced offense and try some different things on offense. I mean, they're much more college. They, they have a much more college of, um, 
you know, more RPO and things like that. We, we wouldn't see that under Moorhead. Uh, so there's, there's more um, diversity in their offense than we would have seen under Evan Moorhead. So I feel like that piece has been kind of refreshing. Yeah, I agree. Cause he's the leading passer and the leading rusher through, you know, two yep. games for Boston college, um, which is like, it's a pretty dynamic. And that's something that FSU has struggled with in, you know, in recent years is the, is the running quarterback, the dual threat quarterback. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see how it stacks up against FSU. Talk about the running backs. Um, I know Thomas is the leading rusher. What do you guys have within the running back room? So that's an interest. That's going to be one of the more interesting uh, positions to watch going into this week. Patrick Garwo, who's been their starter for the last two and a half years, um, is he missed last week? Um, oh, actually, no. He sorry, he played last week. He played two snaps, and then uh, he was in a boot on the on the uh, sidelines. He has not practiced yet this week. I don't expect him to play. I mean, this late in the week to hear that he hasn't practiced yet, and you know, Halfley is usually pretty cautious about telling you things so i get the feeling he's out for a while uh and then you go to alex broom their other running back who missed last week as well um he should be back um it sounds like it but the staff is hard to gauge with injury stuff it's it's, it's as a writer and someone who covers the team it's kind of frustrating because you hear like one thing and then it's like completely the other thing when you hear like pete thamel tweeting out that morning of oh this guy's out this guy's out and you're like i it's you know completely different. So I think there's a good there's a possibility that BC could be down there start t- starting two running backs. So you might see Kai Robichaux, who is a transfer from um, Western Kentucky. He played all last week. One of their bigger backs. I, th- I was impressed. I thought he had a good game. Um, he could be the guy that they go to um, on Saturday. Let's talk about the offensive line a little bit. You guys have um, a pretty good tackle and Ozzy Trepolo who's been playing pretty well first couple of games. What about the offensive line? What do we have in store on the offensive line? Yeah, so if you watched BC and, and Florida State last week, year, you were like, wow, what is with BC? This is a team that usually has good offensive lines, and they were a disaster last year. Complete disaster. They have, they lost four of their starters to the NFL draft, and then Christian Mahogany, who was supposed to be all ACC, blew his knee out playing basketball last summer. Uh, oh. Sorry, tw- summer 22. So they were playing backups. They were, you know, moving in um, defensive linemen, walk-ons. It was just a disaster. It was a mess, a complete mess. Credit to the staff. They go out there. They grab two transfers. Uh, Kyle Hergel, who uh, was on Bruce Feldman's athletic freak list. Um, mm. I guess he can bench press like 600, 700. I mean, like crazy strong guy uh, playing one of those guard positions. You got Christian Mahogany back, which is big. Uh, and then they added Logan Taylor out of UVA as a tackle. So it feels like they've got an offensive line again. And now they've only played NIU and Holy Cross, but what I've watched against even those school schools, I mean, BC couldn't block Maine last year. They they were able to effectively block both teams. Castellanos had all the time in the world if he wanted it. Um, and they look good. They I think they I think they have either zero or one sacks allowed in the first two games. So it's much improved. It's allowed them to run the ball. They had the worst running attack last year. They've been able to run the ball. Um, that's been refreshing. Those are those are, like the offensive line in terms of like a team for a team that lost to NIU and almost lost to, to Holy Cross has been really like the big bright mark of how this team has been playing. Let's transfer over to the defense a little bit. I mean, you have defensive tackle Cam Horsley has been playing pretty well, but BC has given up like 215 rush yards per game so far. Um, what about the run defense and within the front seven? What are you seeing within those guys? So my co-writer, or the writer on my site, Mitch Wolf, he does game analysis. He's, he, he went to school to scout and all that kind of stuff. And I was floored after last week's game when they let up 260 rushing yards to Holy Cross when – we asked Jeff Halfley, were you, are you concerned about your rushing defense? And he said, no. And I was like, what? You know, 260 yards to a school. Like, I mean, Holy Cross is not a bad FCS school. They were in the playoffs. They're good. But against any opponent, 260 yards is not good. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, a lot of it was scrambling yards. There was, you know, they were re- relying heavily on that. So it wasn't like they were able to throw it and run the ball. I still am concerned about it because even if they, you know, the scheme seems okay and the players are making plays at times, again, it's against NIU and Holy Cross. This isn't against Trey Benson and Jordan Travis. I, if they play like that 
and aren't able to, you know, they're miss, you know, one small step in the wrong direction. And these guys are going to take it to the house. So they've got to really clean that up. I think it's a big concern. Cam Horsley has played very well. He's been like the, he's been the bright spot of the defense. Like for, he put on about 15 pounds of weight over the, of good weight over the summer. He looks like a defensive tackle. Um, and, it, and we've been waiting to hear him play strong uh, during the regular season. Cause he always has strong camps. Um, and he seems like this is his year. Um, and he's, he's done a nice job up the middle to really kind of solidify the defensive tackle position. Yeah, that many rush yards against uh, Holy Cross is kind of concerning. Uh, what about the secondary? Yeah. What are you seeing from the secondary? How are those guys looking this year? It's tough to say. Uh, you haven't played against a, a passing team yet, really. And you couldn't really throw the ball that much. Um, and Holy Cross didn't either. Like Holy Cross had a really good wide receiver who made like two really good fluky plays. Uh, not really. I don't want to call them fluky. Like really strong catches that were just, uh, you know, like a strong will. Like you, you had good coverage. They just made it right. Mm-hmm. Um, so we haven't seen them play a good passing attack yet. Uh, and it that and going into the season, honestly, the passing defense was like the thing I wanted to watch most because Josh DeBerry ended up at Texas A and M. Um, jo- uh, Jason Matry went to Wisconsin. They had another kid go to Charlotte. So like three or four of their starters are gone. They brought in Alex Washington from Harvard, Harvard, um, uh, Victor John, uh, Victor, um, Victor Nelson Jr. Safety from LIU. So kids, kids from FCS, which there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously Jared verse is fine. Um, sure. but I haven't seen him play against FBS opponents yet. So big question mark, right? I, I would leave it as I haven't seen enough and <laughs> I'm going to say it this way. I don't think I'm going to see much against Florida State either because I think yeah, these guys are pretty different at receiver. <laughs> they're, yeah, right. Like this is going to be a, an offense that BC won't see again this year. So like it's not really like a fair test to see like if they're good, they're going to get smoked. Uh, but <laughs> but like you, you're going to wait to see like in a, in a couple of weeks and and maybe they make a player too and that's what you you evaluate. Maybe Alex Washington makes a stop on Johnny Wilson or you know you see. Uh, Elijah Jones hanging with, you know, Keon Coleman for a little bit, but I, I don't know. I, I don't think I don't, I haven't seen it and I'm not expecting a, a strong week from them. What's your opinions on Jeff Halfley? I know a couple of years ago, he was looking like he was proud to be one, you know, one of the better head coaches in, in the ACC. Mm-hmm. BC looked very strong, a competent team. Uh, last year, there were some struggles. And then, you know, early on out the gate, you uh, lose against lose against NIU, and then you have a struggle against Holy Cross. What's your what's your what's your thoughts on Jeff so far within his tenure as a Boston College head coach? So it's it's tough. He had a first. I think expectations for him were so strong, especially with the hire. Right, he's a guy. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the top coordinators coming out in 2019. He had a young guy that has seemed to have a lot of. Um, you know, enthusiasm, like you were expecting. He started recruiting really well for, for Boston College, at least. And then Phil Dracovic goes down in, in year two, and then you start to see these cracks all start to pop up. Like they didn't have depth on quarterback that year. They had nobody. Last year, they had no – he didn't touch the transfer portal for an offensive lineman. That killed him. And then this year, like the concerns continue to happen when you go, you're, two, you're two games into a season – where you're supposed to be able to turn things around. BC has a pretty easy schedule. Like you, you avoided Clemson, Wake Forest, NC State, Duke. You, you got Florida State, but like you're playing like UVA and you know a garbage out of conference schedule of NIU, Holy Cross, UConn, and Army. And you go out in the first two weeks and you play undisciplined and messy, and they're making mistakes, and you you're you're wondering like, really, this is like. He knows, I, I know he knows that this is like a, a do or die year for him. It's year four. His, his guys are there. He's, he had the chance last year after a dismal three and nine season to, you know, hit the reboot button on the offensive and defensive coordinator positions, which he did, um, to go out there and ha- like first week, six drops on, on, on your wide, like just complete lack of focus. Then last week you had, I mean, both we actually both weeks you had a hundred plus yards of, of penalties both weeks, and they and some of them, yeah, some of them were like, you know, pass interference calls. You, you're gonna you're gonna live with a few of those. It happens, right? But some of them were just dumb, like undisciplined stuff, right? Like, 
you had last week, you had Thomas Castellanos get called for taunting because he put his finger in the um, defender's face as he was going out of bounds and was pointing at him, then made a lewd gesture at him as he was going out of bounds. And then like, it just, it was spiraling. So I, I'm, I'm concerned, like, yeah, like BC doesn't have the most talent, but when you're playing, like BC has had a history of tough guys, right? The guys that are going up and they don't seem that right now. They seem messy and kind of like, I don't, don't want to say disinterested because they are interested, but like they're not focused. And, you know, the staff has been saying like, oh yeah, we're going to, we're pushing them hard this week. And, you know, that kind of stuff. We're going to start benching guys if they keep doing it. I want to see it. Like they, he, he's mentioned Thomas Castellanos twice this week as if he continues doing this, I'm going to bench him. I want to see him do that if that happens. Castellanos just put out, I just posted it, um, a, an apology. He had to put out an apology. And I, I, I would imagine that the staff said something to him. Because he had, I mean, after the game, after they almost, I mean, if you watch that Holy Cross, I know a lot of people didn't. Holy Cross should have won that game. They just had some stupid fumble at the end of the game that bailed out BC. After that game, Castellanos goes on Instagram and puts up something about, you know, taunting, like basically saying like, oh, the refs gave me red flags and I still made it. Ha, 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 ha. And this is after Halfley White blew a gasket at, at his um, press conference. So I'm the culture piece is what worries me because if he loses the locker room, that's it. That's it, right? This season's going to go down the toilet. He's got to figure it out now. And he's got to figure it. And like, yeah, you're not going to be, you're not going to be Florida State. There's no way that BC's winning this game. But, Maybe you figure things out. Maybe this is the game where you, the stupid pen, like you, 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 you get your doors blown off, but you, you don't make the stupid penalties. You clean things up. You play it. You get your identity back, and maybe that's what he needs. And that then you you go on from here, and you have more winnable games coming up. That maybe you can start to start to build some momentum. Yeah, I agree to your point about BC in regards to the past. You know. You know what type of game it was, you know, coming within the Boston College game, a physical game, uh, yep. bring your lunch pail type of thing. And it was, it was always discipline, too, always discipline of football. So that's a very good point. And maybe a maturity thing with Thomas, but he has to grow up pretty quickly, you know, being a starting quarterback now. Yep. And, yep, that's basically what the staff is saying. Like, you got to do it now. It's, it's your turn. Right. All right. So let's talk about the matchup against Florida State and just what you've seen so far with Florida State and things like that and what you think about Florida State and how BC matches up against Florida State. I know it's, like you said, it's probably not going to be a close game, but <laughs> what do you think uh, Boston College can do to probably have some success against Florida State with and also things you feel like FSU could probably take advantage of as well? So, I mean, I have really struggled to, to see how BC can stay in this game. I just, especially on the defensive side of the ball, I don't, Florida State is so deep and so talented with, you know, two good, really I mean, two excellent wide receivers, uh, uh, all otherworldly uh, uh, quarterback and a running back that torched BC last year when I thought they had a decent defense. I I don't know how they're going to slow them down. I, you know, they had a trouble getting off the field and if they make penalties and give free downs to Florida State, they're done. Um, so the my – the one thing that BC has been able to do, they were able to do it successfully against Holy Cross is they can, they were able to just run the ball and have long drives. Like the, the game against Holy Cross, I think there were two drives total between both schools in the first quarter. Cause BC mm. had like a nine minute drive. They're just moving the chains, moving the chains, moving the chains, keep the ball out of their hands. I, I think that's the only thing you can do is like try to get, prevent them from getting in any rhythm and, you know, maybe with the weather, maybe it gets slippery. And I know Florida State, I saw, was practicing with, you know, wet balls and stuff like that today. But, like, try to, like, try to prevent them from just running you up and down the, uh, you know, down the, the field. That was always Steve Adazio's thing when with BC was, like, slow the game down. Really try to drag it out. And I think that's going to be the only way that they can do it. And I'm not sure that that's even possible. All right, so let me give, give me your score prediction for this game. Um, I know I laughed a little bit, but just hearing what you were saying, I'll just give me your score prediction. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll stick with what I just said on another podcast. Uh, I, you know, was the, the spread's 28, I think. Uh, I was saying something like 52-14. Again, it's all the weather. If if, BC, if Boston gets slammed with, with wind and, and wetness, 
could be a lot. I, I still think Florida State will run, roll, but maybe they don't put up as many points. But if if the game's played with at least decent weather, I I, I don't think BC is going to be much much of a, a threat here. Fifty two fourteen. Yeah, I got uh, excuse me, I got forty five to ten for my score, so around the same ballpark. Before we get you off, it's kind of non related, but I'm I'm a huge a Flowers fan. Um, mm. He was one of my favorite receivers in the ACC last year. Uh, not just last year, during this time at BC, I'm one of the guys I'm like we got to watch out for. And even last year, I, I think this kid's a first round draft pick. I'm a Ravens fan too, so I was very happy that we drafted him. But just talk yeah. about um, a kid like Zay from South Florida going to Boston College and. A year ago, or, or a year, like a year and a half ago, after the big se- season he had, he had a lot of opportunities uh, within the transfer portal. People coming after him, and uh, decided to stick with Boston College. So let's talk about that for a second, um, if you can. Yeah, Zay's awesome. Uh, getting to know him, he's he's everything. He, I mean, you see the smile on his face uh, on BC sidelines or on Baltimore sidelines. That's it. That's him all the time. Like he, his personality and the way he um, lights up a room on top of all the talent that he has, which I've never, I don't think I'll ever see a wide receiver like him at BC ever again. Um, you know, he is, he's a Boston college guy through and through, which is, which is awesome. He's like such a great ambassador for BC. Um, it just sucks that his last year was three and nine, but like, even through all that, he never quit. Like he just, I mean, into the, that, you know, the last scoring drive BC had was him. I think it was a uh, pass to like the four yard line and he busted through about five Syracuse defenders when, when the season was done, like they were down by like 21, they were three and eight at that point, And he still didn't give up. He still wanted to do the best that he can. And he goes and gets, he, he goes and gets drafted. And what happens this year? First game again, NIU game. He's there in the front row again. He's there with his girlfriend watching BC, like BC fans love him because like, Things could go wrong. Zay, Zay, last year you could, like you were saying, right? Like, you could still watch Zay. Like, BC can't block, but just get him the ball. Watch him do his magic, and it it was a show within a show. And he did things that was crazy. And I, and and to go back to what he he came here. Steve Adazio was the guy that drafted. I mean, I'm not drafted him, recruited him, and I, he played one year under Adazio. And I remember it was during the pandemic, and I was at, I was talking to him during a press conference. And I said, Zay, you know what's different between Halfley's staff and, and Adazio and Adazio basically just used him on jet sweeps. That's all he would use him for. And Zay goes, I'm going to actually be in a passing game now. And he was so excited about that. Um, and I remember that. And like every year I'd ask him, I said, what's your goal for this year? Blitnikoff. What's your goal for this year? Blitnikoff. Um, he never got it, but he definitely, I mean, obviously he did everything he could going, you know, top first round draft pick. And now he's lighting up in the NFL and, I'm I'm from New England. I'm a Pats fan, but I, I turn on the Ravens every time I can to watch him. Pl- I'm going to watch him play. I mean, some of the some of the plays he made already in Week One were were crazy. Yeah, yeah. no, I was I was under the impression just watching him like that's an NFL receiver. That don't don't get it twisted without a doubt. Um, maybe yeah. some struggles with um, due to BC situation, but that's an NFL receiver through and through. Mm-hmm. Um, AJ, it's been a pleasure to have you on, man. I really appreciate the insight. Uh, let the people know where they can find you at. Thank you, uh, CJ. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you can follow me on uh, t- uh, Twitter or X, whatever you call it now, at a- AJ Black 247 um, I'm on Eagle Insider, part of the 247 Network. But if you want to hear me talk more, I have my podcast, Locked on BC, that you know, everyone says there's no BC uh, people out there. I talk about Boston College every single day. <laughs> I have a five-day-a-week podcast talking about Boston College sports. Um, and you can, you can check me out there uh, talking BC. All right, most definitely. Um, AJ, it's been a pleasure, man. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Have a good weekend, guys. You as well, man. Stay safe in the weather. Thanks. That's AJ Black, 247 reporter for the Boston College. Right, make sure you guys like the video and subscribe to the channel. Like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you like the content that we're putting out, do your part in um, like and share. Man, we want to get this out to as much FSU fans as possible. You know, we're a new show building the fan base up. So, again, your like and your comment and just subscribing goes a long way with the algorithm and gets it out to, uh, you know, like-minded FSU fans who want to who want to see the same. I want to jump into a little bit of co- a couple of recruiting, recruiting takes, excuse me, before we wrap this thing up and get up out of here. 
Um, so let's jump to some on the trail stuff. On the trail is brought to you by Realtor Jewel Paul. Jewel is a realtor in Southwest Florida. He served, but he services the entire state of Florida. Any buy or selling of your home, Jewel is willing to give you 20% of the closing costs. So again, if you want to buy a new home, if you want to sell a new home, 20% of the closing costs, Jewel will give back to you. Also, Jewel is a big time FSU fan, right? So he's also willing to donate a portion of the proceeds to Battles in to um, help further our athlete, after the, the football athletic department. So again, if you guys want to um, get, in, get in contact with June, his number is 239-321-6994. Jewel Paul, the FSU realtor, get in contact with him. Go nose. All right, a couple guys want to highlight real quick. Just to get some information on, um, not too 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 much, but just a little bit of tidbits. KJ Bolden, a five-star safety commit, or athlete commit rather for FSU top ten recruit within the 2024 class. This state is going to take a couple of visits. Um, he has a visit to Auburn lined up, and a visit to Georgia lined up. He did also state he's going to uh, come to FSU for a multitude of games, including the, including including the Miami game. You know a lot of no fans are asking questions about it. You see KJ Bolden recruit, uh, excuse me, taking visits and excuse me, you no, know, your caution signs kind of come up and things like that. I'm here to tell you, don't I won't worry too much about KJ Bolden his commitment status. I think he's pretty locked in with FSU. He's doing a good job of recruiting for FSU. Spoke to him at the uh, LSU game and he seems pretty locked in. I don't take these visits too seriously for him and also. It goes to the point of FSU, how they play their cards with the KJ Bolden recruitment too. FSU still has their official visit in their back pocket for gate for KJ, which is something I commended the staff on just using those summer unofficial visits to get him on, get him in the fold, excuse me, rather than burning an official visit for him. So again, I think I think we're in a great spot with KJ. His commitment is pretty solid. I think he'll definitely be a no at the end of the day. Just taking a couple of these visits. But again, at, at again, I don't KJ Bolden isn't a guy I worry about as far as his commitment status. Speaking of DBs, Wardell Mack, the four-star defensive back and Florida commit from Louisiana, stated he will be taking an unofficial visit to FSU for the Miami game. That's going to that's turned out to be a, a huge uh, visit recruiting weekend for FSU. It should be a, a dope atmosphere in Doe Campbell Stadium. As you guys know, all the Miami games at home tend to be pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty good vibes, pretty electric atmospheres and things like that. So that's one to keep your eye out on. He um, is going to be on Florida campus for this week for the, for the Tennessee game. So it's going to be interesting. I know U.S. No, sorry, not USC. LSU and Texas are two teams that are still pushing down the stretch for Wardell. So you got LSU, Texas, and FSU. Well, I foresee they have pretty good seasons, and then you have Florida, who he's committed to, who I think will struggle uh, for the for the most part of the season. So we'll see how things play out as far as his commitment status to the Gators. I know FSU probably want to take one more cornerback in War, uh, Wardell, Mack, and, and including Jamari Howard, a part of the two top candidates for that one spot. So it's something to keep your eye out on as far as the uh, commitment status for him. It's always good to get a rival come in on campus too and, uh, you know, kind of cripple them a little bit. So we'll see how that plays out. But like I said, man, the, the game's got to be played and the teams that's pursuing Wardell, I think they're going to have pretty – they have pretty solid teams for the 2023 season. They should have pretty good campaigns, so we'll see how that plays out with them. Um, Four-star cornerback commit Ricky Knight III. He was on campus for the Southern Miss game. Uh, gave a little bit of tidbits in regards to the game. It was a really dope atmosphere. I was impressed myself with all the Noel fans that came out. And um, KJ, I'm sorry, not KJ, excuse me. Knight kind of echoed those sentiments as well. A direct quote. Definitely thought it was a great environment seeing everyone come out to the game, even though it wasn't a big game. Just so just shows how much people care about football down in Tallahassee. And he did also make a pretty strong comment in regards to three guys that he's recruiting down the stretch to try to uh, get to join with FSU. Uh, Jamari Howard, four star cornerback, like I just stated, a guy that FSU's uh, been heavily recruiting, just got a crystal ball from uh, Steve Woodfarm. Um, he did state that Miami is, isn't out of the picture, but I think he's, he'll be a no at the end of the day. I guess it just depends on the timing of Jamari or Wardell, which I, I don't even think Wardell will even flip that fish. I think that spot is going to be Jamari's spot. He also missed, uh, mentioned Jeremiah Smith and JoJo Trader, the um, two five-stars down in Chaminade. With JoJo, um, I think he'll end up sticking with his commitment to Miami. The Canes look pretty good against Texas A&M, and 
Okay, that's another discussion, man. Texas A&M. I don't know what the hell Jimbo got, uh, what Jimbo is doing down there in, in College Station, but it doesn't look good. But yeah. no, nonetheless, the Canes did look pretty good in the game. It was an okay atmosphere in a hard rock stadium, um, a lot better than what they, they usually see. So, so um, I think uh, JoJo ended up sticking with, with the Miami Hurricanes. But Jeremiah, who is currently committed to um, – the Ohio State Buckeyes. That's the one I will, I will watch out for as far as, you know, down the stretch. You know, I've been talking about him a lot as far as the visits. He's been taking the F FSU. Took a visit um, to the LSU game. Also plans to come for the Miami game as well. And has an official visit line of the FSU in December. So Jeremiah Smith is the guy that I'll be watching out for the most. Had under 300, 300 yards last week uh, against the team they played in New Jersey. So one of the best receiver prospects in a long time, man. So that's the guy to look out for. Now, Michigan State, this this could be related to Michigan State just fired Mel, Mel Tucker due to his um, off-the-field trans, transgressions, I, I would say. And it would be interesting to see if, you know, Brian Hartline could be mentioned as a, as a possible name for Michigan State. So that would be interesting as well as far as the uh, Jeremiah Smith recruitment. We're going to move on to the 2025 class real quick. Amano Blunt, the five-star defensive tackle out of Miami Central, number five overall, I guess defensive tackle, defense end, this pass rusher rather. Number five overall prospect within the 2025 cycle. Um, just announced his top five, and that top five includes FSU, Miami, Oklahoma, USC, and Ohio State. To be quite honest, which I think this is the FSU, it's going to boil down to an in-state battle with FSU and Miami, and and don't count out the Hurricanes with this one. You know how 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 those hometown kids be with as far as the Miami Hurricanes and. If Miami can show a little bit of post on the football field, which they've shown early in the season, it was a long season so far. We still got a lot of game, games have to be played. But if Miami can continue with that trajectory, then they'll be they'll, they'll be tough in this recruitment. They'll definitely be tough in this recruitment. I think Odell has established a great relationship with the family, Ryan Barto, and also Randy Shannon. Um, are doing, they've done a great job as well. I know Mom, who's a big part of his recruitment, Loves the FSU staff. I think it'll be a Miami and FSU recruitment down the stretch. We'll see how it plays out. Um, the Hurricanes are definitely going to be a factor down um, in this recruitment, though. Kevin Wynn, 2025 defense, four-star defensive tackle out of Georgia, stated that FSU is number one on his recruit on the, on his um, excuse me, his number one team on as far as recruitment. They're sitting on the top of his list as of right now. I know it's a long process in 2025. But that's something to note for the four-star defensive tackle out of Georgia. FSU has done a really good job in Georgia, um, prioritizing Georgia as a hotbed. Something we done, um, something we done in the past within you know the early nineties and Bobby Bowden, you know, F Tallahassee, South Georgia itself. So you got to prioritize those guys in regards to the talent. And hell, Georgia. Look at the last couple of years, man. I'm <laughs> the talent in Georgia is very good, very good. Almost is I'm, I'm, I'm close to saying is is almost better than Florida as of late. So if you can recruit South Georgia or just Georgia in general in, in Florida, you can recruit those two states, which FSU has done a pretty good job of you know prioritizing that. You could, you could go a long way. I say this with you, you have like a 500 mile, 300, 300, 250, 300 mile radius of Tallahassee. You can pretty much get any type of recruit that you want within that radius. Um, when you have Alabama, Georgia, and Florida within that. Radius, you can get any damn athlete you want, athlete you want, and compete on a high level. And also, you're going to see FSU within these recruiting visits for the home games. They're kind of turning their focus to the 2025 class, right? So you're going to see a lot of those guys on campus for these games in October, just to build those relationships going within the 2025 season. Of course, you're going to see some guys down the stretch for 2024, but FSU is only focusing on a select few of guys remaining for the 2024 recruiting cycle. And those guys, of course, have the focus and will be on campus. But the majority of the, the, the guys you will see moving forward for these game visits will be 2025 recruits. you got to establish that now. So once you have the junior days that roll around during January and February and things like that in March, FSU will have a strong start to the 2025 cycle. So that's just something to note. The 2024 cycle is pretty much done for FSU. you got to focus on a few more guys um, down the stretch. And that'll be it. So the majority of the focus moving forward will be on that 2025 class. So again, man, make sure you guys like and subscribe, like this video, and subscribe to the channel. Another episode of Dope Talk. I'm gonna preview. We're gonna have a live, um, a live show going on for the uh, Boston College recap. 
and we're going to have some callers come in and, and talk to us as well just to see how FSU done did, excuse me, within the Boston College game and then, you know, going into week four against that big Clemson matchup. Again, make sure you guys like and subscribe to the channel. Go Nose.